Hi everyone, um, my name is Amanda Bakerly and I'm the VP of Operations for AIJ Boston and a founding member of Maduma, a digital health startup in Boston. Um, so I'd like to welcome you all to our event today. It's designed for COVID-19, inspired by lessons from global health. I'm super excited for today's event. We have an incre incredibly impressive group of speakers who've designed effective solutions within many areas of global health and who've moved very quickly with their teams to support with COVID-19 efforts. So as is true for most diseases, this pandemic has been and will continue to disproportionately affect those in lower income, lower resource minority communities across the US and the world. So I'm particularly excited to hear from our speakers since they've shaped their careers around achieving equity in health for people worldwide. Okay, so as a brief intro to our organization, AIGA is a professional association for design with 73 chapters and is run by all volunteers. For today's event, we'll start with presentations from each speaker on what their teams have been working on to contribute to COVID-19 efforts. And after this, we're going to move to a fireside chat with questions from you all. Okay, so I'm going to welcome our first speakers, Elizabeth and Tim. Elizabeth Johansson is the founder and principal consultant for Stark Health Design and is the director of product design at Vexis Technologies. Stark Health Design uses human-centered design to help clients develop world-class technologies that lead to better health outcomes globally. As a design engineer, human factors engineer, and program lead, Elizabeth has contributed to eight product launches and, uh, design, and, and contributed to a design that matters Firefly, the phototherapy device that's currently treating newborns with jaundice in hospitals in over 20 low and mid middle income countries. Tim Prestrero is the CEO of Design That Matters, a nonprofit organization that collaborates with international aid agencies and hundreds of volunteers to design breakthrough medical devices for low resource hospitals in developing countries. Products that Design That Matters has helped design and launch have treated a total of 70, 750,000 patients worldwide. In 2012, Design That Matters was named the winner of the National Design Award. Elizabeth and Tim will be speaking with us today about the role of context in the design of medical devices for low resource settings, contrasting the work developing a newborn phototherapy device for low resource hospitals in Vietnam with work designing a reusable face shield for American hospital staff. So I'll hand it over to you first, Elizabeth. Thanks, Amanda. I'll share my screen. So as Amanda mentioned, um, both Tim and I have worked together for quite a while, and I'm really honored to be able to speak alongside him today at this event. My uh, consultancy is called Spark Health Design, and we focus on human-centered design for positive health outcomes. Uh, please feel free to contact me also after the presentation at my email address below. I actually started my career um, without really a focus on global health. I spent about eight years at a leading design firm called IDEO. And in that case, I came in with the background as a mechanical engineer, and I really learned human-centered design while I was at IDEO. Um, but over time, I started to realize that there was a systems view that we could potentially take um, and that I wasn't necessarily able to take while working there. For instance, one day I'd work on a way to vend more Pepsi in the grocery store, and another day I would work on the Eli Lilly Quick Pen Insulin Injector for uh, helping people with diabetes. And I realized a lot of these are connected, and the more Pepsi we sold, and the more, the more insulin we would then sell, and the more IDEO could continue to make a lot of money. Um, so I wanted to find a way to work on, use engineering skills and also design skills for positive global health. And I started to volunteer with Design That Matters and eventually joined them. And you know, by working with Tim and Design That Matters and many of the others on this call, one of the things that really opened my eyes is uh, aspects like this picture. This is taken by Steve Ruby from Gradient Health Systems. And this is a typical medical equipment junkyard that you'll see in many low middle income countries. And in fact, this statistic is really shocking. Almost all the uh, devices that are developed for industrialized countries, when they go to a low resource setting, they're either not turned on at all or very quickly break. And so I realized a lot of the work that I've been doing, uh, working with Fortune 500 companies and so forth, designing medical devices, you know, those medical devices, not only are they costly, but there are many other reasons why they aren't effective in a low resource setting. And you know, this is just part of that list. But in particular, one that I wanted to highlight today 
is, especially the consumables, things that are supposed to be disposable, often become reusable in a low resource context. Um, here are three examples of some designs. The one on the left is the phototherapy device that uh, I worked on while I was at Design That Matters. And one example here was uh, bedding. So often bedding for newborns who are getting phototherapy is um, something that's not necessarily washed, even though um, there are new newborns being put on that bedding. So one example of that design consideration being taken into the context of a design for a device for a low resource setting is the, the bed that you see here. So you see a clear plastic bed that's really easy to wash and wipe down. And because we saw that most families bring their own linens, that allows each family to kind of take control over the ability for their newborn to have a clean bed. Um, so that's just one example. I wanted to also highlight two other examples. These aren't products that I've worked on, but are from other great social enterprises. One is MTTS. They've recently rapidly designed and launched a new ventilator, which is appropriate for low resource settings and really appropriate for COVID. So one of the considerations here is that tubing. The tubing that goes to the patient is often reused because it's hard to find other tubing or it's too expensive, et cetera. So their device accommodates a tube that can be cleaned or autoclaved. And another example is from Lifebox, who's a nonprofit working in safe surgery. They looked at pulse oximetry, which is used to measure how much oxygen is in the blood. And usually there's a 30 or $40 sensor that's supposed to go on and be disposed of with every patient. So you can imagine how you know, that might not work as well. So they've redesigned the pulse oximeter to take low resource countries in mind by having something that's reusable on the finger that's really easy to clean. So these are just three examples of how you know, technology that already exists in a scientific sense can be redesigned to be much more impactful for low resource settings. And so as the COVID-19 pandemic has hit, we started to see signs of what, you know, Tim and I had both seen in working in many hospitals in low middle income countries, that was starting to happen in the US and in Europe as well. So things that were normally meant to disposable, be disposable were now being reused. And one of the responses that we had to this is to partner on the creation of a reusable face shield to help prevent spread of the disease to healthcare workers. Um, so this involved both the creation of instructions for use as well as a 3D printed version and a version that's for mass production and injection molding. Um, and so I think really the experience in working in both of these contexts for low middle income countries and now for the US, which has you know, temporarily become a low resource setting, um, and seeing the great energy of people in coming together, this project involved more than 80 volunteers. Uh, one of my hopes is that a lot of that energy and focus on design for context of need can kind of translate more broadly and internationally. And even after the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, for those communities that really are the majority worlds that are operating day in and day out in the similar kind of context where a disposable becomes a reusable. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Tim to continue the, the dialogue. So uh, hopefully that worked. Uh, thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, and so I'm just going to go into a couple of details about the projects um, and specifically sort of what we learned around the face shield project. And this is more generally, uh, uh, we've been accused of running design and metaphors, right? So, so every good design experience is a metaphor for every other design experience. And in this case, looking at face shields, we realized that we had to pick our metaphor for what we were gonna make. Uh, a lot of, we, we were one of many, many groups uh, who jumped into face shields. And one of the basic sort of divisions between face shield projects were people who were attempting to reproduce the conventional uh, single use or disposable face shield that's kind of a hospital standard equipment versus making a reusable face shield. One of the challenges at the very beginning of a project is to figure out what's your model? Like what, what, what are we going to attempt to replicate? And we realized that if we tried to reproduce, the, there, were, there were real limitations to trying to reproduce a uh, single-use face shield because nobody was using single-use face shields anymore. Everybody was reusing face shields because of supply constraints. So you really have to choose your your design metaphor carefully. Uh, there's 
in this case, it's, it's about not mistaking form for function. We recognize that the function of the, the, the real need was for a device that could be used over and over again. Uh, and so by choosing to make a, a, re, a reusable, uh, it's a face shield that's designed to be reusable rather than it's going to be reused sort of by accident or, or that's going to be an adaptation of the user. Uh, and so this got all the way down to the design of the face shield and plus the design of the instructions, uh, making it clear that it's, it is appropriate to reuse this device and we're going to make it easy to reuse. Uh, so that, that gets into choosing your metaphor. I think the other thing about it is recognizing that between product and outcome, there's some amount of complexity. So we design for outcomes. You make a product because you want to get a specific outcome and whatever complexity or whatever challenges exist between the intent and the outcome whatever aspects of that complexity that the designer doesn't handle has to be managed by the user so for example in the field of single-use face shields we saw a lot of enthusiasm for these sort of origami or user assembled face shield and on the surface it makes a lot of sense you you die cut a piece of plastic, you can send tons and tons of them in a single box, and then users just fold them when they get them and stick them on their face. It's just when you do the math, you realize that a typical hospital can use 3,000 face shields in a day. It takes a couple minutes to, to, I mean, they say folds in less than 60 seconds, maybe after lots and lots of experience, but when you're spending a couple minutes folding these face shields, suddenly you've got 100 staff hours a day of just folding face shields or for a single caregiver who might go through 20, 40 masks, they're spending 40 minutes every day of their 12 hour shift just folding face shields. So in a sense, we've exported the complexity of face shield assembly onto the user who is, they got other stuff to do, uh, particularly in COVID. So uh, Donald Warren's got a great quote from Apple about how complexity is conserved. So there's, there's an irreducible amount of complexity. And the question is, how much can you as a designer remove from the user experience? So basically, the more time and effort you spend as a, as a designer, it's sort of like you're taking the work so that the user has less. Uh, and so again, with our face shield project, the focus was really on how do we make this thing easy to assemble? Can we spend extra time as designers thinking about how to make this experience as easy as possible for the user? We've done this in another context. So the phototherapy device that Elizabeth and I worked on that she mentioned earlier, with conventional phototherapy, it looks like it's pretty hard to use wrong, but the reality is that it's very easy to use wrong. We noticed that there's nothing about a conventional phototherapy device that tells you not to put multiple babies under it, for example, and not to have babies sharing beds. Just looking at the clinical effectiveness of phototherapy, uh, the lights are designed to treat a single baby at a time. And when you pack multiple babies under the lights, the problem that you have is that not all of the kids are actually receiving clinically effective phototherapy. So again, another one of the design insights with, with the Firefly device was, how do we make it so that the right way to use it is the, e is the easiest way to use it? Or how do we make the device hard to use wrong? Uh, and so we spent a lot of design time, again, trying to pull complexity out of the experience. Last point, Elizabeth talked about this challenge of uh, cost. So with a conventional pulse oximeter, very necessary for uh, diagnosing pneumonia, for example, in low resource settings, you'd think that, okay, well, that's, I mean, that's expensive, but it's not unreasonable, except that the sensors, the disposable sensors can easily rack up to many, many multiples of the purchase price. So there's a, there's a significant difference often be, between the purchase price and the cost of ownership. And really the thing that we wanna consider is the total cost of outcome. If we wanna successfully treat a newborn, for example, what are all the costs that might show up? So again, we might think of the purchase price and the delivery price, but then there's the ownership, like how hard is it to, how, how much time do you have to invest to train people how to use this device? What is, what is the maintenance cost of it? What are the consumables? So re replaceable parts, as Elizabeth was talking about with tubing or sensors, is the cost of complexity. This, this gets into this idea of that complexity is conserved. 
if we release a very complex device, what is the cost of user errors? One of the costs of, of a complex device may be that nobody ever uses it. There's that picture that Elizabeth showed of all the junk sitting outside the hospital. There are ma actually many, many costs uh, when you consider the total cost of out outcome. So again, if we don't do a good job on the design and this medical device takes longer to treat uh, than another device, what is the opportunity cost of slow treatment? If the, if the device is hard to clean, what is the cost of patients acquiring an infection in the hospital? So many, many, many different costs show up in the total cost of outcome. And one of the key insights for us in designing for low resource settings is that you have to consider all of these. You have to consider complexity. You have to consider really what is, what is the metaphor that we're designing for. And then finally, what is the total cost per outcome? Thanks. Thanks so much, Tim and Elizabeth. Okay, I'd love to introduce our next speaker joining us from Uganda, Dr. San Santorino Data. Dr. Data is a pediatrician lecturer and director of the Center for Innovation and Technology Transfer at Imbra University of Science and Technology, and the Uganda Country Director of the Consortium for Affordable Medical Technologies, CAMTEC. He developed the CAMTEC Uganda Innovations Ecosystem that supports development of affordable medical technologies for low middle income countries. Dr. Data founded the Simulation for Life program that combines medical simulation methodologies and technology innovation to advance clinical skill development for frontline healthcare workers. Dr. Santorino Data will be giving a presentation on the social distancing app in help design um, and we'll be talking a little bit about more of his efforts uh, in, uh, in working with his, his team at CAMTEC. Santorino, I, I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you so much, Amanda. So when the COVID um, pandemic struck, first of all, the response in our country was to lock everybody up. And then the plans for reopening happened. And when these plans were, when these plans happened, we quickly realized that naturally we are social human beings. And as social beings, we like to be close. And this situation is especially so in Africa. We like to greet, we like to hug, we want to be happy. And that's like tradition in Uganda. And all of a sudden, COVID comes and we are supposed to maintain social distance. And clearly when people came out of um, the lockdown, this was becoming a real problem. We are going out there and missed each other, they were hugging and they were greeting and it was becoming a problem. So we wanted to help and we wanted to help in a way that reminded people to keep their social distance. And so we set up to develop the social distancing app. So this was a two week project and intensive research and trials here and there. And we ended up developing an app, which is now on Google Play, you can download it. And this app uses both your GPS, uh, locations on the smartphone, and your Bluetooth. And so when you have installed this app, you go into public, if there are people who have the app near you, they are represented with the red dots that you see there, and you are represented with green. And so when the app, when you are closer than two meters apart, it will tell you, please respect social distance. And you can look at your phone and you can see from which direction the social distance is bridged based on the red circle so that you know which direction you should go to, to, to keep distance. And when you have the app and there are people who don't have the app, then it uses the Bluetooth and detects the Bluetooth of the other person and calculates a two meter distance. And if the person comes closer than two meters, it alerts you to respect social distance. And if that person doesn't have the social distancing app, 
it will not, that person will not be represented by a red circle. So you will need to be able to see around you and look for to create social distance. And so that's one of the ways that we rapidly developed this. And so there are three features of the, the app. One is for the social distancing alerts. And this feature is completely developed. The feature that is under, the, there are two other features under development. One for travel planning and one for COVID-19 safety room arrangement. So the travel planning, when more and more people have this um, app, you can know historically which areas are very congested and which areas are less congested. And so if you are planning to go to one restaurant and you can see which restaurant has good social distancing setup, and it will appear as a less congested uh, restaurant. And those places that have uh, no social distancing um, measures in place, they will appear as uh, more congested. And the room arrangement one, as a, an organizer of a public place, you can use the social distancing app to really determine the room arrangement so that um, people can adhere to social distancing in your restaurant or in your hotel or in the public place that you would like people to come into. So this is one of the, the things we, we did for COVID-19. But before we did that, we had, um, for a long time, for about three years now, we've been producing hand sanitizer, uh, the brand Sanitrop. And this hand sanitizer has had very little market because the market for hand sanitizer in Uganda was very small. So we kept very, very small. And when COVID came in, all of a sudden, the market for hand sanitizer was couldn't be quenched by the two companies that we are manufacturing hand sanitizer locally because we couldn't import. And we were two companies that we are manufacturing hand sanitizer locally and we couldn't really meet that what? That demand. And so we worked, we were producing hand sanitizer literally 24 hours a day and we still couldn't meet that. We rapidly went into expanding our production capacity, which is much more now. And what we realized was with every week that passed by, people were increasingly becoming hit by the economic crisis. And more and more people were becoming unable to afford and hand, hand hygiene measures such as hand sanitizers. And so we sat down and said, oh, they need this, but more people are not able to afford. How do we stretch every dollar to make sure that more people can still afford hand sanitizers? And so we redesigned our business model and saying, instead of being really for profit, and making some profit out of this. Let's do partnerships. If you're in a, a non-profit organization, you can partner with us. And when you bring your order for hand sanitizers, then we really calculate the cost of raw materials, the cost of production, and then we will be able to give you hand sanitizers at cost so that every single dollar of yours can afford more hand sanitizer and it can last longer. So that was it. And as the director of the simulation center, we had another problem. So people knew that donning and doffing to protect yourself adequately PPE is a, is a skill that needed practice. 
And when we wanted to use simulation to do that, we realized that our country did not have a lot of PPE to spare for training. And so people we are going for COVID training and one person will say, this is how we do and this is how we don't. And the rest of the participants were not having any chance to actually don and doff. So as the Simulation for Life program director, we sat down again and said, so how do we help? So what we ended up doing is that we developed PPE, especially the, the coveralls and the gowns that were safe to reuse. And we did that and we used them for training so that we can spare the non-reusable PPE for real clinical care. So those are some of the adaptations in our work that we had to do. One, to develop this social distancing app. The second one, to think of ways to rapidly increase production, but do it in a way that many more people can access honey sanitizers and to make training for COVID-19 more sustainable. I thank you. Thanks so much, Sandrina. Our last, uh, our last speaker is Christian Olson. Um, Dr. Chris Olson is a pediatrician and internist and serves as a member of the core educator faculty and the chief innovation officer in the Department of Medicine's residency program at the Massachusetts General Hospital. He's the director of the MGH Springboard Studio and the Consortium for Affordable Medical Technologies, CAMTEC, an associate professor at Harvard Medical School. Chris has worked extensively in low and middle income countries, as well as the US, to develop medical solutions focused on value by using design thinking. Today, Chris will be speaking to us about how lessons his team has learned in a global context help them build effective COVID testing booths in the US. All right, I'll hand it over to you. Chris. Okay. So uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. I, I'm in this enviable position of, of coming after um, three of my uh, good colleagues who I've learned so much over the years from, from Tim, Elizabeth, and Dotta. And, um, and, um, and so uh, I think one thing I could easily say is just uh, ditto. Um, but but I'll, I'll, I'll sum up just some of the lessons we learned um, really from working in low resource settings that were so applicable to uh, the current COVID crisis. And I, I think everyone would, uh, uh, on this call, certainly uh, agrees with this statement that um, the best solutions come uh, really from people who are closest uh, to the challenge. And, um, and if I uh, try to see if I can, there. Um, so uh, a lot of people on this call, this is um, um, uh, just second nature to them if, you, if you're a designer. Uh, one thing that we know well within healthcare is it's amazing how there's been a blind spot of thinking of, of design thinking for use in healthcare. Uh, such that so many times really uh, solutions that could have an incredible impact or a potential impact um, uh, within the field are never implemented. And, and sometimes for justifiable reasons, but oftentimes uh, just because of, of the design and not answering those, those jobs to be done and not taking into account the complexities as, as Tim was mentioning. And so just thinking of that intersection of, of really what's desirable, feasible, and what's viable. And when we think about viability in terms of scaling is, is so essential uh, to work that, that uh, we've been engaged with overseas and that we've learned a lot from. Uh, and then also uh, really relevant um, uh, here as, as I'll, as I'll mention. And so th this is an event that, um, uh, we run together with, uh, uh, Dr. Data in Embarara. So this was the end of August, beginning of September, um, last year. 
where it's a collective problem solving event in healthcare, where uh, in in Embarara, and this one was focused on nurses and midwives, and and uh, you won't know the the skill sets of this group, but they're they're students from engineering, from healthcare, from medicine and nursing, and the um, in the blue shawl is. Um, uh, the the director of nursing at Embraer University collectively working on a project that really has moved forward and and makes a difference in in that setting, and and so um, I'll give another example on on a project that Dot, uh, Dr. Data and I have worked on together for years um, around enhancing the ability of frontline providers to to resuscitate newborns uh, in the developing world is, is where it was initially focused. And, and so on your left is this, this um, uh, device, which is called the Augmented Infant Resuscitator or AIR device, being trialed in Uganda. If you back up the steps even before this trial, um, the feedback that we received from frontline providers who often didn't consider themselves innovators was invaluable in terms of thinking about even how a device fit into that bag valve mask that you're giving a breath to a newborn, how the feedback is given to you, even the color of, of the device and, and making sure it didn't look like a toy. Um, that it, I think some of the initial versions were, were say green and they said, look, you know, this is, um, it can't look like it's not a serious medical product. Um, in this case, you really learned that a lot of the, the uh, design constraints of, of portability and robustness and ease of use were really relevant here in the United States. So on your right is, is this device being trialed uh, at Mass General uh, Hospital. And what we found was really remarkable that uh, if people were randomized to getting the air device um, they had uh, a maximum of two minutes of training of how the device worked. Usually people shut us off at 40 seconds and said they'll go. And, and people with feedback um, attained proper ventilation in less than half the time and main, maintained that 50% uh, longer, even on the first use, uh, which was really remarkable. But it, it, it led us to, to really... Um, highlight, and you'll see uh, um, uh, Dr. Data is one of the authors on this paper um, that we wrote in 2016, but, but not only just saying what are the design constraints and, and why um, uh, it can be difficult to, to come up with solutions in a really low, low resource setting, we actually turned it to say why would we preferentially want to innovate uh, with our colleagues in uh, low and middle income countries. And a few of them that we had come up with in this article is, is there certainly can seem overwhelming needs. Um, and what's important about that is really taking a, a, a challenge driven approach so that we could break down the oak tree into its component toothpicks and need being the mother of invention is probably the most important thing. And then what we found were really those frontline providers that didn't view themselves as innovators really had in-depth and practical clinical insights, largely because of a large uh, patient to provider ratio. We also saw unique perspectives that stimulated creativity. And, and we largely saw that by getting people from different disciplines who, who weren't part of the usual cadre of solution makers or viewed themselves as innovators, but people coming in and saying, well, why don't you do it this way? And, and that was really um, uh, an insight that just hit us in the face over and over again. Um, one thing that was really true is this lack of legacy infrastructures. You know, um, the way that healthcare is really set up in the United States is, is it's designed in its current hospital structure to be how we delivered care in the 1960s. And, um, and there were things that could really be implemented in, in a faster way um, in Uganda and uh, India. And then one of the other things that, that was absolutely true is there was economic incentives for value-based uh, delivery. Oftentimes people think of 
of devices or novel solutions as uh, just increasing costs. And I think that once you take a value approach and thinking uh, that it's really uh, outcomes over cost and changing that ratio, that, that you can have a, um, a really a, a larger impact. So one thing I'll mention that the Springboard Studio was asked uh, through the Mass General Brigham's uh, Center for COVID Innovation that was set up at the beginning of, of the crisis. So really it was third week of March. Um, uh, I was asked to, or charged with uh, co-leading the whole body protection working group. And, and we were uh, tasked with three things um, uh, from the leadership of, of Mass General Brigham or the entity formerly known as Partners. And they asked us, they said, look, is there a way that we can uh, either test or treat patients in a safer way uh, for patients and providers? Um, can we save on this, this crisis of uh, not enough PPE and, and can you decrease the amount of PPE used? And then thirdly, um, can we maintain throughput, say with testing, in a way that, that doesn't slow us down because we have um, an overwhelming need here? And so when you look down the, the, what we saw as um, really desirabilities of working with um, colleagues in low uh, resource settings, we were seeing all of these um, uh, newly or, or more starkly emerge um, in the United States. And so um, I'll show one, one example of what we, we built and, and give um, some examples of these. So, so this um, is a testing booth that's um, sitting at Mass General now. Uh, we call it the, um, the hexapod because of the, the six arms on it. And, and I'll say the principles of being practical were um, uh, for a, uh, delivering on a real need in the hospital, uh, uh, we believe was, was why the uh, leadership contacted us with, with a, a YouTube video from South Korea where uh, they had built uh, testing booths that were um, negative pressure where the tester would be on one side and then you would go into the booth and wash it all down. Um, it was interesting that within nine days, and um, uh, one of our team members, Noor uh, El Sultan, had called the president of the hospital in in uh, Seoul to say, "Hey, what's been your experience?" Um, uh, he was uh, so gracious and sharing of of his experience, and and then we we set off on building this booth, and it and it wasn't this booth; a different one was in place at Newton Wellesley Hospital's testing site in nine days, and um, it looked entirely different than this. In fact, it was a negative pressure booth with the arms going in and the patient being tested inside. And because of the feedback from from uh, the uh, infection control experts, from the nurses who were using it it turned into this uh, booth for throughput that had the tester inside three different walls, one of those walls being um, ADA or wheelchair uh, adherent. And, and now the post implementation numbers really tell us that uh, it takes about a, a minute, 46 seconds in between uh, patients being tested. They can test well over 200 people in, in a given uh, day. And, um, and there's been a 96.6% .6 reduction in, in gown usage. And, and I'll say that um, if we hadn't started off with, with really working in a way that, that thought of all those, those reasons for, for being thoughtful of, of design, uh, we wouldn't have been able to answer this challenge um, uh, in Boston and now, now far beyond with, with these booths. Thanks so much, Chris, and thank you all. That was that was so fantastic. Um, very impressed by how quickly your teams delivered solutions to meet the need. Um, so I think the first question to start off, maybe to you, Tim, is what trade-offs? And uh, Elizabeth, jump in as well. What trade-offs did you have to make to uh, to deliver the face shield just so so quickly? Well, I think. For Elizabeth and I, one of the the, the time pressure was intense. 
Uh, and one of the other aspects of time pressure is we saw a growing number of uh, ideas. So lots of people were making face shields. We saw lots of people making disposable model face shields, including big companies like Ford, uh, Apple. And one of our first insights was that uh, if, if we're going to make a claim about what we've designed, there has to be some kind of evidence to back it up. And so we had a we had a prototype. I, Elizabeth, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we had the prototype within three days. And this was <laughs> actually Chris was wearing prototypes. I mean, we were all sort of working together, uh, 3D printing and shipping stuff around the country. Uh, and it was less than a week after the in fact two days after the first uh, clinical reviews with the prototype, we we froze the design so that we could focus on regulatory approval. Uh, and we really had to pioneer a process for getting a 3D printed medical device to have some kind of validation, certification and validation. Um, and so I did not expect, a, fr a friend of mine uh, had built a chemical engineering company and they ran into a problem with uh, regulatory approval of one of their products. And they said that, oh, we were a great chemical company with this regulatory problem it's like no no you're you're a regulatory approval company with this like chemical engineering slideshow in in other words everything everybody has to say yes right users have to say yes but without regulatory approval uh even during a pandemic there there are sort of minimum standards you have to observe and so i i feel like that for me uh, elizabeth i'd like to hear your perspective but that was definitely the the greatest anxiety moment. Yeah, I think um, one of the things just reflecting on experience previously working in corporate America and then working with you, Tim, at Design That Matters and then working with you, Santorino, and with Chris as well over time, um, seeing some of the differences in the work, I think one of the ways that it was possible to do a good design fast is that we had a lot of bandwidth. Um, and Design That Matters has always cultivated an amazing community of people who are willing to, at a moment's notice, jump in and contribute whatever their depth of professional skills is. So thinking about like how I would do a project inside a for-profit corporation, you're kind of looking to your team members who are your fellow employees, or maybe you'll execute a contract to pay someone, and a couple of weeks later, the NDA will be signed. Um, what was amazing about working on something that's open source and working on something with Design That Matters community is that we could get people with regulatory background and material science, engineering, 3D printing background. You know, we had folks from many, many different companies um, all just jump in, even within that one week, to make a design that could still, you know, that could really, you know, work well for the situation, being a reusable face shield. Um, and I think the other piece was being able to do background research. So I, uh, you know, being able to combine that medical device experience background, because I know a lot of companies jumped in and, and haven't necessarily launched a healthcare product in the past. So we did do a lot of research early on and <clears throat> made all of that also open source through MGB COVID innovations and also open source medical device uh, COVID supplies so that anyone else designing a face shield could benefit from some of that research. You know, and part of that was seeing that aerosols go up and then they probably also come down. So a lot of the face shield designs didn't really have a way to protect from the top. Um, so that's one of the features that was incorporated into the DTM face shield. And then you see it in many other face shields after that launch. It's really amazing that how much you, you both champion uh, open source design and we have a I see we have a question from the audience as well for Sandra Reno. Um, under what open source license does the MGH CamTech uh, license all of the ideas, treatments, and products? Yeah, thank you. And I think that question may be best answered by Chris Olson, who is actually based at MGH. So, um, so there are certain ideas that, that can scale in an open source manner. There's a number that just don't, and, I, and um, this might be controversial. I'd love to hear people's uh, opinion. And I see from the uh, people who are um, 
who are attending this, that there's a lot of ex expertise uh, in the attendee panel uh, from India. I see Nitesh and I see uh, other people um, on the group. So one thing that, that we've done is, is um, Camtech or Springboard Studio doesn't uh, own IP unless we're part of the creation of, uh, of it, either know-how or patents. Um, and, and so what we've done is realize that, that sometimes open source actually is a limitation to getting things scaled and manufactured. Um, it really is on a case-by-case -case basis. Anything within Mass General is, is um, that we ourselves create is automatically the IP is owned by the institution. Um, I think Dada is in the same uh, boat with Embraer University, but, but actually one thing that was really fantastic through this is because we also, the, with the booths, um, uh, it was one thing that I sort of, I had glossed over, but the Mass General Brigham Center for COVID Innovation helped, you know, when I talked about the legacy infrastructures overseas, they really helped drop those. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Lee Lee was um, uh, doing a lot of the, the navigation of the, um, the approval process for each stage of the booth and whether it was an, an ISO certified company or not. So. So in that case, we didn't make it open source, but we have given um, uh, royalty-free licenses. Um, like for example, we, um, as uh, Dr. Data was thinking about uh, perhaps adapting them to Uganda, we we provided that as a royalty-free license. So so I'd say it's on a case-by-case -case basis, and and open source is fantastic when people are able to manufacture it themselves, but it actually for um, certain devices that take more in terms of um, manufacturing, it can actually limit people wanting to undertake the, the, um, uh, the risk uh, and outlay of, of starting a whole manufacturing product line. So I, I hope that answers the, the question. Yeah, and to build on that, I'd say that sometimes uh, licensing is a way to do quality control. Uh, so with the face shield, we were, we saw sort of three phases while we were waiting for sort of conventional supply to catch up with demand. There were going to be people 3D printing them in their homes. There were going to be businesses 3D printing them and then eventually going to injection molding for a larger volume. And with other medical devices though, for example, with the phototherapy device, uh, we have a licensing agreement with the manufacturer which builds a relationship with the manufacturer, which gives us the ability to do quality control and to see that often the, the, the aspects of the design that are intended to deliver the target outcome may not be obvious. And so by building a strong relationship through a licensing agreement with the manufacturer, you can see that all of the different components of the design are realized in the final, final product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's it's really interesting how um, how critical the uh, or how much of a barrier um, potentially for regulatory or otherwise can be in the um, in the fast implementation of, of solutions. Um, so I'm I'm curious to hear a little from from you, uh, Santorino. Um, what that has been like in in Uganda and the solutions that you spoke about. Can you just uh, repeat that question, please? Yeah, the regulations. How has how has um, the regulatory landscape in Uganda? How did that? Um, how did you how did you overcome any barriers or challenges in implementing solutions that you designed? Right. So. As far as regulatory challenges, regulatory landscapes are concerned, first of all, for all the solutions that we design, we want to design them to the highest international standards that uh, are possible, knowing very well that uh, our country, Uganda, does not have really its own independent 
entities to, to regulate medical devices, for example. So at the end of it all, we rely on either FDA or CE um, power devices. And in Uganda, as long as your medical device is CE approved, they will not give you any trouble about it. So what we do is when we try to design medical devices, say, okay, let's design it for CE approval or for FDA approval, design it to the highest ISO standard you can find and then you will have no problems with the country. Could I just mention in too, just um, with Dada and what they've done with the SANI drop uh, process, the, that it, it wasn't an FDA or CE approval, but with your Bureau of Standards, um, right, with, um, with SANI drop, they held them to really rigorous standards. And in fact, they had hired somebody from uh, PepsiCo, I think, uh, or- yeah, We hired somebody from uh, the Nile Breweries, which is like, um, is yeah. the, one of the biggest uh, brewery companies in East Africa. So we got that to enable the design to, you, to meet both the Uganda standard and also the East African standard. Right. And that was how we were able to get the quality mark for the product. Right. So that, that quality mark, I just remember um, when Dada first achieved it, the, the, um, the Bureau of Standards inspectors came by and said, this is the smallest operation that we've ever approved, but it is the most organized. And in my mind, Dada, I think that as you scaled, and I might have the numbers a little wrong, but I think they were producing something like 125 liters a week at the beginning of the crisis. And their, their capacity has increased to over 4,000 liters a week or you know 1,000 gallons a week of sand drop. And it's because of that, that organization, I think, that enabled you to do that. So, That's right. Way to go. Yeah. If we didn't have that uh, quality mark and our, our facilities we are not uh, audited for good manufacturing practices already it will have been just impossible to scale because what happened was when the crisis set in so many people went into producing hand sanitizers including fake ones coming into the market and so the national drug authority then started going really tough on uh, those who are producing hand sanitizers without any regulation. And so that was a very good spot to find yourself when you, your production facilities were already audited and certified and your product was already certified. It was a good spot to find oneself. Mm -hmm. That's great. So another question from the audience here. Um, that how do you how do you see the importance of the designer being also atten attending to the aesthetic dimension um, within the desirability of design thinking um, and that they've seen in their experience that a common issue in health related products is there's much more attention to detail to um, functional functional dimensions or uh, and, and otherwise. Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. So the one of the big aha moments as we were, um, when I was at Design That Matters, when we were working through the Firefly design process was to realize that even very effective equipment um, that was technically effective, if it didn't look easily approachable or if it didn't look trustable and medical, some of the themes that Chris was speaking about in his talk about the resuscitator device, um, it, it again would go into that closet of equipment that wasn't going to be used or ever turned on. And, you know, partly, especially in the low resource environments in the majority world, because the training is different and because the staff to patient ratio is different, um, people are more risk averse a lot of times is what we found in terms of using something that they weren't totally sure that they could use well or that the device itself, they weren't sure if it was going to work well. Um, so it was one of those tough, tough moments in designing Firefly because the most immediate thing that comes to mind is the reason this equipment doesn't work 
in low middle income countries is because it's too expensive. So that's, you know, just the purchase price of the device, but really um, flipping that and like most of the speakers spoke about thinking about outcomes per dollar and spending a little bit extra to create something that in Firefly's case is a plastic part. So it's a little more expensive, but it looks more modern. It references contemporary aesthetic and people around the world know what those contemporary modern devices look like. Um, so, you know, we were really pleased in one case, we, we came to a hospital with a functioning device, but just for a demo, we were actually um, working with MTTS and they were going to demo a variety of their other equipment, but we had just this one sample device. And really a lot of the staff uh, gravitated to just that one Firefly device and wanted to immediately put it into use and felt really comfortable just looking at it, knowing that there's an on button and it turns on and then you press it again and it turns off. Um, so, you know, that was a kind of nice anecdotal moment of validation in terms of the role of the aesthetic in, in helping people feel like it's an accessible technology that they can use and use it effectively. Mm -hmm. And just part of the reducing complexity thing that you were speaking to, Tim. Yeah, the idea is that you can certainly make it hard to, you know, there's this sort of equipment that you can learn to love. Uh, and that's just assuming that somebody's going to make that investment. Uh, what's, what's the fruit durian, you know, it smells like death. Uh, so if you're, you know, <laughs> pick your metaphor, like we're, we're making the durian of medical equipment, you know, it's, it's actually really, really effective, but you got to get past that yuck factor, you know, and, and the fact that it looks like, an Iron Maiden death trap, you know, but if you actually use it, it's fantastic and it's really effective. It just turns out that, that uh, there's, there's a great line that in, in medical device design, the, the patient is always watching and people can choose not to get care uh, or they can choose not to use the equipment. Uh, I think one of the biggest fallacies in design for low resource settings is that something is always better than nothing. Uh, and no, actually, sometimes the nothing, the, the sort of base state is one that people are very comfortable with. Uh, and so, yes, it is a valid question to, it, it matters to make, to worry about adoption. We have a question from, um, from India, from someone in India, um, and they asked for, there's a question for Tim and Elizabeth. Um, there was a concern um, with uh, handling infected shields in COVID wards and that they would rather spend more than take the risk of reusing shields. So um, wondering what, uh, what, what are you, you sort of um, thought about that and how you took that into account in designing your solution. <laughs> yeah, that was a, a certain attention in design. And I think Tim described part of that process well, where we were seeing different hospital systems also jump into the mix and try and figure out how they were going to solve the face shield challenge, you know, looking at the foldable flat pack face shield and so forth as one of the potential solutions out there. Um, what we started to realize is a lot of the big healthcare systems in the U.S. had the resources to continue to do something creative to get disposable face shields, uh, but that there were still a huge number of facilities even in the U.S. that, um, excuse me, there's still a huge number of facilities even in the U.S. that weren't going to be able to just contact their own injection molder and start up a new product line. So, you know, I think um, for some hospitals, trying to maintain that disposable stream makes sense. But personally, my, I have two aunts, or I have an aunt and a cousin who both work as nurses in the labor and delivery department here. And they work at a big hospital in Boston, and they're still reusing their disposable face shields. Um, and so there's also can be a disconnect between the hospital system themselves and the kind of theory of what they're hoping they'll provide and the reality of people on the ground who say, I can't risk running out again. Mm -hmm. So even if my superiors say it seems like there's a good supply, mm -hmm. I'm going to keep reusing them at the department level or at an individual level. I'm going to be wiping these down. Um, and so I sent a couple 3D printed face shields to my, my aunt and my cousin and they're using those in their ward. Yeah. That's great. There's, go ahead. Oh, go. I, I was just going to say, 
I think it's one essential piece is, is uh, uh, design is not necessarily like baking and where you come out with a ta-da moment and the cake's already done. Um, that, that really there's iterative um, uh, change and there needs to be post-implementation evaluation of what's actually happening. And so, so I think that, that really uh, doing a comparative analysis of, of what's happening in the hospital and highlighting that uh, can be difficult. Uh, but just as Elizabeth said, a lot of the single use um, face shields were being reused uh, over and over again and people really trying to overcome the single use aspects of it and wiping them down. And, um, and, and so I think really um, doing an evaluation of that and then after implementation of yours and, and being able to demonstrate that, it's just that it has to be done um, very thoughtfully because um, it's it's not always uh, welcomed to highlight how how actual practice varies from theoretical practice at the administrative level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I I would say that one one odd detail about the face shield project is that the first group that we consulted uh, when we were getting into trying to figure out whether this was sort of a valid need. Uh, we didn't talk to clinicians. We didn't talk to infection control experts. We actually talked to the supply department at the hospital uh, and asked them, like, where, what do you see in terms of PPE limits, uh, expecting to hear face masks? And they told us, no, we're, we're out of face shields in a week. Mm. Uh, and that is our priority. Mm. Now, the interesting thing is that the sense of urgency translated through the organization at different rates in different departments. And so on the clinical end, there was a, a high sense of ur urgency on the administrative side. Uh, so again, after we had our, our final uh, concept and we were doing clinical trials uh, in the emergency department at a hospital, uh, I was invited by the director of the emergency department to come in and actually observe people using the face shields. We wanted to see where did they put them? How did they take them on and off? Uh, unfortunately, by the time I got to the emergency department, uh, the director was tied up with uh, a very sick patient, and uh, the administration in the emergency department, like, who the hell is this guy? Uh, why is there some random dude standing in the corner with a notepad, like, taking notes and talking to people? Like, this is, he doesn't have a badge, so nobody is allowed in the emergency department without a badge. They came over to ask me, like, uh, are you a vendor? Like, are you, you need to fill out this vendor paperwork. Oh, I'm not a vendor. Are you conducting a clinical trial? You have to fill out this clinical trial paperwork. Like, mm, nope, I'm not. Just doing some observations on these 3D printed face shields that the director has been hand carrying into the department and distributing. So there were, you know, so, so at, the administrative, at, at the administrative level, I was like a, a virus in the system, you know, like get, get this guy out of here uh, because we're, this isn't an emergency, these are regular operations. And in regular operations, you can't have <laughs> random dudes with a notepad standing around, it's a terrible liability. So I do think that uh, to go back to the question about, oh, they don't wanna wash them, uh, wait. Uh, either, either wait until they all recognize the scope of the crisis or find the person, as Elizabeth and Chris were saying, find the person who is experiencing the crisis directly and they're gonna be a better advocate mm -hmm. for the need than you will coming in and saying, ah, I'm pretty sure you need this. You know, you gotta kind of fish where the fish are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tim, you were speaking to this a little bit just now, just uh, kind of identifying where would be the, um, where you can really make the, the greatest impact as a designer and an innovator. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak more to your um, thinking process there, or if anyone else wants to jump in and add, um, answer that question too. I'd love to hear from Dada because there, there are, for, for their group, so many different places where you could apply the resources uh, from Emberara. So when you do prioritization, for example, uh, for hand sanitizers or the app, what, what are the factors for you uh, that, that make something a priority versus you, you wait to tackle it later? Yeah, 
Yeah, so, and really most of our prioritization ways <laughs> came from what Chris and team taught us. And it's really about how big the problem is, you know, um, many times we are happy to do the things that are in our comfort zone. So we have the skill for, and so I, if I'm a software designer, I want to solve any problem with writing code, but most of the times your skill set may not be the solution to the greatest problem. And so really taking a moment and saying, okay, let's forget about our skill set. Let's focus and ask what is the greatest problem right now? And how is that problem affecting people? And how many people are really talking about this problem and are facing this problem? And I think focusing on the problem is, in our experience, is the best way to really decide what to choose. So for example, the hand sanitizer thing, we had lines and lines of people, like in a day, we had never sold hand sanitizer or $3,000 or more. But one week after the COVID crisis had set in, when we had our first case in the country, the sanitizer we were producing in a day was almost always sold out the following day. And so, there was a real need, a palpable need, and people were coming. Supermarkets were calling, pharmacies were out of hand sanitizer, hospitals couldn't cope. They didn't know where to, and that was a problem not, it was a problem out there. It was not something that we are comfortable really meeting, and so we prioritized that, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, I'd like to end with um, a quick rapid fire question. Um, so in two sentences or less, could each of you answer the question, how do you think that we can uh, make um, innovation and accelerated innovation and faster approval uh, more of a norm in healthcare? I would say start the process with the regulatory standards in mind. Yeah, I, I would say uh, marry, uh, marry early. Uh, you, you've got to find who is going to use it, who is going to approve it, uh, who is going to make the purchasing decision, uh, and find those people as early as you can uh, to inform all of your work. Uh, it is so much easier to edit a sucky first draft than it is to build your Parthenon and then bring it to the world and have them say, oh, we really wanted a bus station. <laughs> One thing I can say is I, I think there's uh, an unprecedented opportunity right now in the, in the face of a global COVID pandemic that has brought down a lot of barriers between the different organizations with a common purpose. I think one thing we can really do is capitalize on, on this moment in time and demonstrate the outcomes and even the time that it, it took to achieve those outcomes. Because now we're up to, you know, not even three months of implementation of some of these uh, devices. And if we can continue to use this as an example each of us that are on the on the call and and um that have joined in to say how do we demonstrate that this is a better way of doing business and none of us want uh to have things done rapidly and in an unsafe manner but to align um expertise uh out of silos 
And maybe I'll build on those comments and say, you know, as an individual, think of the world as your team. Because if you're working towards something that has a clear positive outcome, it's amazing the expertise you can get into the mix, whether regulatory or anything else. Uh, right from the beginning. So reach out, think outside your box, outside your particular community or your team, um, because the resources are there to do something really well and, and also do it fast. Okay, thank you all. I could spend all day asking, asking you guys questions. So <laughs> this was a great glimpse into what you've all been working on and your thought processes and how you design solutions really effectively. And, and thank you, Amanda and Amelia and Nathan and AIGA for, for hosting this, this event and getting us all together. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. All right. So we'll end with a couple of um, just a couple of quick wrap up slides. Um, thank you again to everyone who joined and, um, and our speakers. Um, they've kindly shared their email addresses here. So if you have any follow up questions, feel free to reach out to them. Um, and also thank you to Amelia and Nathan, who were our co-hosts today, and all other AJ Boston um, volunteers and board members who helped made um, this event possible. All right, and uh, we have another uh, virtual event happening through July 10th. It's our annual portfolio review. And uh, due to hardship with COVID-19, we've opened up our review to be free for everyone, and we highly encourage underrepresented designers to sign up. And you can visit uh, boston.aiga.org to learn more about this as well as other initiatives. And our board is growing. Um, so you, we really need more support and we also aim for greater community representation. So here are a list of some new open roles on the board today and really don't hesitate to reach out to Lauren. Um, her email is lauren at boston.aiga.org. Uh, just to learn more about some of these roles. And um, lastly, um, we'd really love to hear from you all. We'll be sending out a post-event survey in the coming days, um, just to make sure that we're programming and putting out content that you as the, um, as the Boston design community, and also now since all our event, events in the, coming, in the new future will be virtual, um, also designers from around the world um, that have joined this event today. Um, and so thank you again, and thank you for everyone for joining.